We're glad you're here for worship this morning. It finally feels like fall out there, doesn't it? That felt great this morning. Uh, we're glad you're here to worship. I'm going to invite you to stand as we read together our call to worship. This call to worship comes from Psalm 71. And it's going to be up here on the screen. Let's read together. In you, O Lord, have I taken refuge. Let me never be ashamed. In your righteousness, deliver me and set me free. Incline your ear to me and save me. Be my strong rock, a castle to keep me safe. You are my crag and my stronghold. You are my hope, O Lord God. I have been sustained by you ever since I was born. My praise shall always be with you. Let my mouth be full of your praise and your glory all the day long. Amen. Would you pray with me real quick as we begin our service of worship? God, we're grateful to be here, and we are rejoicing in the day that you have made. God, we're grateful that today your mercies are new, just like they are every morning. So God, as we come to worship, we, we pray that you would be lifted up, and you would be exalted. And God, when when we exalt you, you say that when we lift you up, you draw people to yourself. So God, we pray that you would be lifted up and that you would draw us close to your heart this morning. We love you and we give you this hour. In Jesus' name, amen. Our worship team is going to lead us in a couple of songs.
doing today. Patrick is a little under the weather, so it's gonna be a little heavy Becky today. <laughs> I'm just backing him up a little bit. <sighs> All right, we're gonna do actually a new song um, right before the sermon that I'm really, really excited about. I hope you guys will like it, look it up on YouTube. A little bit later, maybe it'll get stuck in your head throughout the week, which would be lovely. <clears throat> Ready? One, two, three, four, five, six. Our scripture today comes to us from the Psalm 85, verses 1 through 4 and 6 through 13. 
Lord, thou wast favorable to thy land. Thou didst restore the fortunes of Jacob. Thou didst forgive the iniquity of thy people. Thou didst pardon all their sin. Thou didst withdraw all thy wrath. Thou didst turn from thy hot anger. Restore us again, O God of our salvation, and put away thy indignation toward us. Wilt thou not revive us again, that thy people may rejoice in thee? Show us thy steadfast love, O Lord, and grant us thy salvation. Let me hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people, to his saints, to those who turn to him in their hearts. Surely his salvation is at hand for those who fear him that glory may dwell in our land. Steadfast love and faithfulness will meet. Righteousness and peace will kiss each other. Faithfulness will spring up from the ground, and righteousness will look down from the sky. Yea, the Lord will give what is good, and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him and make his footsteps away. The word of God for the people of God. Oh God, hear your people praying. Every person that came to the sanctuary this morning is a minister of your grace and your love. We reach out to the people, whether whether it's an exchange student or uh, prayer for those who are fighting a battle against cancer or other infirmities that we've lifted up. Lord, we we pray for everyone who needs a touch. We pray for those who are seeking employment today. We we know it's it's really a terrifying thing to be in a world that costs money and not to have a way to, to raise money to get there. So, God, would you hear these earnest cries of people who are looking for jobs? And would you hear and answer graciously? We believe prayer makes a tremendous difference. In the first service, somebody had been praying for a a cancer patient for a long time, and all of a sudden, it looks like there's great relief coming. And it just reminds me that you always hear the prayers of your people. You answer in so many different ways, and in times when it even looks silent like you're not answering, sometimes it's then where you're doing the most beyond all that we've seen. Now, you know the cry of our hearts. There are many in the congregation who are discouraged for one reason or another because we live in a world that is very discouraging. There are many who need that encouraging touch in this very service of worship. Would you do it? Would you make the service of worship so encouraging today that people leave saying just what the psalm writer said? I was glad when they said, let's go to the house of the Lord. And now, Lord, we... uh, We also pray uh, for Eric. We pray for my son-in-law, Frank, and all the rest that are serving in the armed services, Lord. Your hand is upon them. We thank you for the people you raise in this country to serve. And they serve us. And we don't even know their names many, many times, but you know them by the tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands. We give you praise. Now we ask your protection. Lord, in this service of worship, we're praying along the theme of fresh wind and fresh fire. Would you put a fresh wind in our sail, the wind of the Holy Spirit? Would you put fresh fire in our hearts that we might burn brightly with the love of Jesus Christ? Would you hear the prayers that have been offered all across the room today? And Lord, we give you thanks. And we, as your people, in turn want to Respond by praying the very prayer you taught your disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, Glory forever. Amen. God bless you this morning. We're going to ask the ushers to come forward as we offer our gifts of love to the Lord.
If the ushers are coming, we got a couple announcements. Tonight is our hymn sing. You guys don't want to miss that. Six o'clock right here in the sanctuary. We're going to sing some of those old songs of the faith. We'll have some fellowship together. And then uh, what else do I have on my list? You guys have bulletins too, though. Don't forget your uh, tear-off cards, your connect cards. We want to know who's here and, and what is going on in your lives, how we can be praying for you and how we can come alongside you. So I'd love to hear right now tear-offs all across the, the sanctuary. You can drop those in the place as they're coming. Um, this Saturday, we have the women's breakfast coming at 8 o'clock. Deb Manjardo is going to be the speaker for that, so you want to come and hear her. Uh, and then on the 28th, mark your calendars, 4 o'clock, we're having a fall fest. It's time to come together, have some fun. We're going to have a kickball game out there, see how bad the kids can be, us adults, us old people. And uh, we're going to have games and a bonfire. We're going to have food and a good time to be together. So I want to encourage you, the 28th, 4 o'clock, mark that on your calendar for Fall Fest. Um, You're not old, by the way. I'm not old? <laughs> <laughs> Do I get to play with the kids? <laughs> yep. yep. <laughs> our, our worship team is going to lead us again. One.
want to give thanks to the praise team. Something that we, we don't notice, like if you were in our adult choir or something like that, work hard to do one song a week, but the praise team does five songs a week, and it's a lot to learn and a lot to do, and they log a lot of hours. They're not all fun hours, but they find a way to make it fun because it's great to fellowship with our band, and I want to I want to say thank you. And I want all of our congregation to bless them. Again. Yeah. You all are great. And if you want me to just share with you how blessed you are, Scott and I will sing next week. And uh, you'll, uh, it'll be driven right to your heart. I shouldn't even include Scott in that one. But hey, I have with me... Uh, I thought this was funny because we've been doing a lot of uh, ch children's things, you know. And on Wednesday night, and I hope you'll take time to come out and uh, engage. We're doing a Bible study up here, and you know, we've been having, uh, you know, around 90 people, but we've also been having uh, between 15 and 20 kids, and it's been, a, it's been a wonderful thing. I just, you know, happened to look to see what they were doing last week, and they were dropping Mentos in two liter soda bottles and watching them explode, you know. It, you know, that's fun. That could have been dangerous had I had that knowledge when I was in school at the, uh, my, my principal was just saying, thank you, Jesus, you know, that I didn't know those things. But, but one of the kids just looked and, and, you know, did one of these. Wow! And then they taught you know, our, our little ones, you know, guys and gals, that that's what Jesus does when he comes in our heart and he gives us a joy and it, it finds ways to bust out of us. It's contagious. You know, that's good biblical teaching. No, no, I'm going to scratch that. That's great biblical teaching. If we as uh, the church at Trinity can find just to rely on God for that joy, it becomes a wow factor because every one of our friends needs uh, something better, something more, something gracious, something life-giving and life-transforming. And you have it. You have it in you. Well, it's fun. Now here, it, it, it was thinking thoughts like that about how cool our kids are that I, I did a little, you know, research on these things that pastors have fun with. And they all sent in a fun letter from a kid between age 8 and 12 and took the one line out of there that really struck them. So here we go. I've got 16, but I'm just going to pick my top five. Number one, dear pastor, I know God loves everybody, but he never met my sister. Sincerely, Arnold, age 8, <laughs> Nashville. Does that sound like a familiar family? <laughs> Number two, dear pastor, please say a prayer for our Little League team. We need all of your help or a new pitcher. Thank you. <laughs> Alexander, age 10. That's practical praying, right? Okay. Number three, dear pastor, are there any devils on earth? I think I may know one in my class. Carla, age 10. Number four, I got to kick out of this one because they brought mom in there. That's a bad, bad idea at any time, you know. Whatever you want to do, you'll never escape what your kids are going to say that they never should say about parents. You know, have you ever noticed that? Boy, it was a disaster when our youngest one turned two. Woo! Okay, dear pastor, my mother is very religious. She goes to play bingo at church every week, even if she has a cold. Yours truly, Annette, age nine. Oh, yeah, I'm sure her dear mother appreciates that. Okay, now, the final one, dear pastor, I think, you know, I, I should send this one to Pastor Glenn, too. You'll know why in just a minute. Dear pastor, I think a lot more people would come to your church if you moved it to Disneyland. <laughs> Lorraine, age nine. So there you have it, administrative council. We ought, to, we ought to put that on and talk about it, you know, moving, moving it to Disneyland. Well... It is, it is a lot of fun. Today, of all the things in the world, I get the privilege of uh, standing as a minister of grace to you. And the topic 
from God's Word is so exciting. It's the topic of where mercy meets grace. Where mercy meets grace. So if you're taking notes, two just little definitions, and it's like a tongue twister because they are. Mercy, the definition of mercy. Mercy is when you don't get what you deserve. Say that with me. Mercy is when you don't get what you deserve. And grace is when you get what you don't deserve. See, God's mercy, John Wesley loved this verse. It was his favorite verse. So the founder of Methodism, mercy was right at their center doctrine. His favorite verse was, his mercy is over all of his works. See, needing mercy is a judgment day consideration. We don't talk a lot about judgment day. If you want to preach a series of sermons on judgment, go ahead. But at the next SPRC meeting, you know, that's trouble. They're going to be reading letters like those letters those kids got. Dear Pastor, <laughs> nobody likes to think about judgment, but it, but it is an honest intellectual position for all people to need to know that the Bible says it is appointed unto all human beings once to die, and after death comes the judgment. Lord Alfred Tennyson, that great poet laureate, wrote a, a sermon, and his sermon was called Remorse. He was trying a one-word poem to conjure up the image of what it must feel like when we stand before a God and realize the verses of Scriptures, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Now, we go two ways in society with things like that. We, and they're both bad, one is we just don't don't think about it. Or worse yet, in our pride, we don't think it's any big deal to, to disobey God. Or, or the other one is, we're such a wretch, such a sinner, such a hell-deserving blasphemer that our whole life is wrecked in guilt. Those are the polar opposites of people trying to deal with judgment. But do you know, I've got great news for you today. The Bible says that God's mercy is over all of his works, even on Judgment Day. A merciful God is the God that says, mm, I knew Pastor Ron in Millville even, and I've decided to perfect what concerns him instead of judge him in the death of his sins. Boy. Even at 945 in the contemporary service of worship, that ought to get an amen. amen. We're not going to get what we deserve. And do you know how fresh that is? The Bible says his mercies are new every morning. Hey, no matter how long you've been a Christian, when you got up today, there's something in a merciful God reaching out to you that is brand new. And tomorrow will be the same. And the next day will be the same. Now, mercy is when we don't get that judgment that we deserve. We don't get that punishment but do you know how it comes into our life? When we repent and ask Jesus to come and live in our heart, he gives us grace. Grace is when we get what we don't deserve. The grace of God is awesome today. The grace of God helps everyday people who have fallen short of God's glory to rise up above it. You know, we sing it sometimes, the band will start singing, let the glory of the Lord. I think Synergy sings this most often, let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Right, Chris? The glory of the Lord because there is grace that's free. It's the free grace of God. The Bible says where sin did abound, there did grace much more abound. Now, I want to use an example of mercy and how it turned to grace today, where mercy meets grace. I'm going to use an Old Testament character, and even I am a little surprised that I'm using this character because you don't hear 
a lot about him anymore. You usually hear about his dad or his uh, grandson, but you don't hear as much about him. That is the character Isaac. What I want to share with you in this story is how mercy meets grace is that there was a couple and uh, they were around 100 years old. And the angel of the Lord shows up in their life and says, I'm going to give you a child. They wanted a child, but they went way past the childbearing years. And God showed up and he said to Abraham, who was 100 years old, uh, this is the RSV, Abe, I heard that prayer. I know you think I'm about 60 years too late, but I'm going to give you that son and he's going to be yours. You're going to be the father of that son. And out of the tent, you hear this. <laughs> That's his wife. Sarah's laughing the angel of the Lord out of there. I can see what she's thinking. Well, if he's married to me, that's the best joke I've heard all year. And uh, the angel of the Lord said, no, seriously, God is going to give you a son. Do you know it was so hilarious to Sarah, the thought of them having a son? She was embarrassed. You know, it is embarrassing when a 100-year-old guy goes to the Walmart and checks out a baby buggy for Christmas. <laughs> Says, I'm going to have a son. Hello? Hello? Abe, you don't need a baby buggy. You need a psychiatrist. And Sarah's right there. Now, you know what Sarah does? She tries to help God out. Now, look, God, you know you can't get a baby out of me. I, you know, I know you're God, but even God can't get a baby out of me. That's the first thing I want to say to you about mercy and grace today. There are many here that may not believe God could get what he wants out of your life. Great things. But God can get what he wants out of your life if you'll be open by faith. You know what happened? I was a rowdy enough kid over in Millville to where when they heard that I was going to be a minister, every one of the organizations gave money for me to go train to be a minister. It's true. I got more scholarships in Millville than any other senior of that graduated class. They all gave me money because they, they really wanted to see, because if he can be a minister, there is hope in our world. Right? None of us believe what God wants to get out of our lives. We can't believe it's for us. I want to tell you, Sarah's sitting out there. He wants to get hope and promise and blessing out of you. I want to tell you, Abraham's sitting out there. Your day to be a mighty man of God is just still beginning. And you know what else? When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing his praise than when we first begun. Listen to what Abraham was told about Isaac. Isaac was born, they named him the laughing one. <laughs> the laughing one. Who's thinking that guy's coming out of Abraham? And Sarah. But there he is, the child of promise. And he begins to grow up. And now listen to how powerful Genesis 22 is. Now it came about after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham. And Abraham said, here I am. And he said, take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac. And go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. Now, in verse 7, I want you to know this. This isn't Isaac, a little baby. He, he's grown into a very keen understanding. And so, in verse 7, Isaac spoke to his father. Can you imagine the bond between them, me and my hundred-year-old dad? that God gave a promise to. Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, my father. And he said, here I am, my son. He said, dad, 
I see the fire. I see the wood. But where is the lamb that you offer for the burnt offering? Where is the lamb? Man, that's a great question for us. Today in our spiritual life, we ought to ask the question, where's the lamb? And they came to the place which God had told them, and Abraham built an altar there. He arranged the wood, and he tied his son up, his son Isaac. He laid him on the altar. Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife as if to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven, saying, Abraham, here I am. Don't stretch out your hand against the lad and do nothing to him, for I know that you fear God, and you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. Then Abraham raised his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him, there was a ram caught in the bushes by his horn. Now, it's not just taking up space about the ram. The ram had to be caught by his horn. You know why? Because to offer a sacrifice to God, the offering had to be unblemished. It had been, if it had been caught in the briars and bloodied up, it couldn't have served as the sacrifice. And do you know what Abraham said about that place? My God provided the lamb. My God provided the lamb. Now, I want to jump forward. I was uh, doing a tour, and, and once in a while, educational opportunities, and some people would, would, would ask me, as, a, as a, a professor at a theological seminary, to go and to lecture at some of the holy sites. And so, at one point, uh, a couple times, I flew over to Israel, and, and I was assigned the passage of Scripture to talk to them about that passage of Scripture. Here's something that fascinates me. Do you know the second most holy site for Islam besides Mecca? It's called the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem. And when you go into the Dome of the Rock, of course, they, they want you to leave the Bible aside because the Quran is the holy book, and you, you go in, and then you kneel down on a mat, and you can receive a lecture there. And so I took training there, and they said why the Dome of the Rock was the holy site, second only to Mecca. It was because on that rock, Abraham offered up Isaac, and God provided the lamb. Oh, brothers and sisters, I would have loved to have been in that room that day, in the heaven of heavens. When God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit were looking into time and eternity and having a conversation, and God's only begotten Son, the child of promise like Isaac was, said to his heavenly Father, look, Lord, there's a crowd there at the feast of the Passover on the holy rock, but I don't see any ram caught in the bushes. And the Holy Spirit says, Father, we're going, aren't we? Father says, we're going to go ourselves." And he said to the son, will you trust me? If I make you the lamb? The son says, that's painful. To take all of that sin and become an offering? For all of that sin, and the Spirit says, are you willing to go? If you go, I'll raise you from the dead. And the Son says, I'll go on one condition. This is Romans 8. That the same Spirit that raises me from the dead will also give life to the bodies of all who believe. You hear that? This morning, that's where mercy meets grace. All of you have sinned. You know how I know? The book says it, but you're like me, flesh and blood. 
I've sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There would be judgment, but mercy is when we don't get what we deserve. There's something better. There's a merciful God. And he sent to the rock a lamb without blemish so that you and I could be cleansed from our sins. But then you know what else he did? The Spirit kept his word. He raised Jesus from the dead. Do you know the rock is the beginning of that Christian pilgrimage called the Via Dolorosa in Jerusalem now? The path of the cross? Same place. God had a lamb. Jesus Christ, your Lord. And he went to Calvary. Not just so you didn't get what you deserved, so that you got what you don't deserve. You get Jesus and a new life. And the same spirit that gave Jesus life now is available to give you life. Why? Because the God whose mercy is over all of his works is a God who says where sin did abound, there did grace much more abound. That's the way to get fresh wind and fresh fire. There's grace for you today coming from Jesus Christ. And it's a grace that is greater than all of our sins. But here's what God says to the Sarahs and to the Abrahams. Will you take my child of promise and live for him in such a world, way that all the people in your world can see that for you to live is Christ. God wants to let mercy meet grace in your life so that you can go spread the mercy and grace of God to your world. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Let's have a prayer and then our, our team is going to come and they're going to sing about that mercy and grace. Let's pray together. Hey, as we pray. Any Abrahams, any Sarahs here, anybody here that knows that you know that you know you need the mercy of God and you need the grace of God? Listen, if you're that person this morning, I want you to hear your pastor telling you this. God's got more than you could ever, ever begin to fathom. And he says this, the one that comes to me, I'll never turn away. So come to him this morning. In this sanctuary, come to him. Give him your heart. Give him your condition. Just open up and say, Lord, I'm in need of your mercy. And if you'll give me your grace through your only son, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll go and live as a child of promise for Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray this morning for those who want you, for those who need you, for those who want to say yes to the greatest free gift and the greatest news on the planet, that you so love the world you came to us. Thank you for being the Lamb. Thank you for being the Savior. Thank you for being our God. Now come, and we put our faith in you. We choose Jesus. Amen? Amen. Let's stand as they sing.
Far be it from me to not believe Even when my eyes can't see In this mountain that's in front of me We'll be thrown into the midst of the sea So the rest of the story in two sentences, Isaac went out and obeyed God and he chose the woman God had for him. They had a son who had a son, a grandson named Joseph that saved two nations. And out of Jacob came the promise of the covenant of God for you. It's amazing what one person given over to God can do. You can change the world. Therefore, allow the mercy and grace of God so to meet in your life that you'll be the man, you'll be the woman of God that trusts God so that the world will be forever different, starting in you. In the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit, go forward in peace. Amen? Amen. Amen. God bless you.